Let me just mention a couple of points. One of the most important facts, I think, undergirding the empty tomb is, oddly enough, the burial story of Jesus. If the burial story of Jesus is accurate, then that means that the site of Jesus' tomb was known to both Jew and Christian alike in Jerusalem. But if that is the case, then it seems to me that the inference that the tomb was found empty is very near at hand. For if the burial site of Jesus were known, then it would have been impossible for the disciples to believe in the resurrection of Jesus and proclaim this in Jerusalem when Jesus' corpse still lay in the tomb. If Christianity or the resurrection was preached in Jerusalem itself, as it was, the very city where Jesus was publicly executed, where his grave remained and was publicly known, the disciples could not possibly have believed that he was risen from the dead in the face of a closed tomb. And even if they had, scarcely anybody else would have believed in them if they proclaimed anything so silly. For a first century Jew, the idea that you could have a spiritual resurrection while the corpse still lay on the tomb was simply unknown. That is an invention of 20th century theology, not first century Judaism. And in any case, the Jewish authorities certainly could have made an end to the whole affair by simply pointing to the closed tomb of Jesus and said, look, that grave is occupied, he is not risen from the dead, and that would have been the end of it. And therefore, the accuracy of the burial story, I think, provides powerful grounds for affirming the historicity of the empty tomb account. And unfortunately, for those who wish to deny the empty tomb, the burial of Jesus is widely recognized to be one of the most historically credible facts that we have about the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. So that uh, those who deny the empty tomb are also forced to deny the burial story, which is uh, a desperate expedient since it is so historically well attested. So that would just be one aspect. Um, another aspect of the empty tomb narrative itself, as it's found in the Gospel of Mark, is that this portion of the narrative was probably part of Mark's early source material that he used for describing the, the passion and the death of Jesus, the, the last week of Jesus' life and his crucifixion. Uh, the burial story marked the close of the passion of Jesus as he is laid in the tomb and the stone is rolled across its entrance. Uh, and the empty tomb story was probably part of that passion story because that story would not have been circulated without victory at its end. Uh, without the empty tomb, the passion story is incomplete. Also, the empty tomb story is connected to the burial account by syntactical and linguistic ties. For example, the pronouns used in the empty tomb story have their antecedents in the burial story, so that it's really one smooth account. Now, when you remember that Mark is the earliest of our Gospels, that means that his source material was even older uh, and this uh, passion narrative that included the empty tomb story could have gone back to within the A.D. 30s even. Remember, Jesus was crucified about A.D. 30. So that we're talking about a source that is extremely old and is therefore a valuable source of historical information. Also, the empty tomb story itself, thirdly, is extremely simple and lacks any signs of legendary development. I think the best way to appreciate this would be to compare it to accounts of the empty tomb that are found in apocryphal gospels, that is, forgeries uh, dating from the second century, such as the so-called Gospel of Peter. In the Gospel of Peter, uh, the narrative describes the resurrection of Jesus itself coming out of the tomb. Uh, the narrative proceeds by saying that uh, during the night, there is a loud voice that rings out from heaven, and then the stone across the entrance to the tomb rolls back by itself. Then two men are seen coming out of heaven and going into the tomb. Then three men come out of the tomb, two of them holding up the third man. The heads of the two men stretch up to the clouds, but the head of the third man overpasses the clouds. Then a cross comes out of the tomb, and a voice from heaven asks, Hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the, the cross answers, yea. Now, these are how real legends look. You see, they're colored by all sorts of theological and apologetical motifs. 
And these are noticeably lacking from the mark and empty tomb account, which seems to be basically a straightforward report of what actually happened. If I might just mention a couple of other points that I think are significant. The empty tomb uh, was probably discovered by women. And I think that this is evident when you contemplate two aspects of the role of women in first century Jewish society. First of all, women occupied, quite frankly, uh, a low rung on the Jewish so social ladder. They were second-class citizens in first century Palestine. This is evident from such Jewish uh, rabbinical sayings as the following, sooner let the words of the law be burnt than delivered to women. Or again, uh, woe to him whose children are female, but blessings on him whose children are male. Uh, women were not as highly regarded as males in that society. Secondly, the witness of women was regarded as so worthless that they were not even allowed to serve as witnesses in a legal court of law. If a man were seen committing a crime by a group of women, he could not be convicted on the basis of their testimony because their witness was thought to be so unreliable that it wouldn't even be admitted into court. Now, in light of those two facts, how remarkable must it be that the empty tomb story describes the discovery of the empty tomb by women. The fact that it is women rather than men who discover Jesus' tomb empty suggests that this is a historically credible account. Any later legend would have certainly made the male disciples to discover the empty tomb. Peter and John, for example. The fact that it is women that discovered the empty tomb, women whose witness was worthless and counted for nothing, is best explained by the fact that, like it or not, they were the ones who found the empty tomb, and the Gospels faithfully record this fact. One final piece of evidence that might be mentioned would be the fact that the earliest Jewish polemic or anti-Christian propaganda itself presupposes the empty tomb. The earliest Jewish polemic that was uh, launched against the Christian proclamation, he is risen from the dead, was to state that the disciples came by night and stole away his body. And then the Christians responded to that, that there was a guard at the tomb and they would have prevented the theft and so on and so forth. Now the interesting thing in this, in this dispute is not the, the historicity of the presence of the guard. Rather, the interesting thing is what the Jewish polemic was saying in response to the Christian proclamation, he is risen from the dead. Were they saying, uh, these men are drunk with new wine, or uh, his tomb is still out there on the hillside? No, they were saying the disciples came and stole away his body. Now think about that for a minute. What that implies is that the body was missing. The earliest Jewish polemic was itself an attempt to explain away the empty tomb. And thus we have evidence for the empty tomb, which comes not from the Christians, but from the very enemies of the earliest Christians themselves, which is historical evidence of first-rate quality, because it comes not from the sources which believed in the resurrection, but from those which disputed it. So on the basis of reasons like this, and many others, the majority of New Testament critics today affirm the historicity of the empty tomb story.